Welcome everyone to the Cardano Effect podcast, episode 34. The purpose of this podcast is to take high-level developer information and projects that are occurring within the Cardano space and break them down into bite-sized, consumable pieces of information for everyday use. I'm your host, Philippe, and let's get this podcast started. So we have all three hosts of the Cardano Effect here today. We have Sebastian, Rick, and myself, and we have some very special guests who Rick will be introducing very shortly. It's a very exciting time. As you can see, this episode is being done a little bit differently. We're live, so drop some comments in the chat section. We're going to try to get to those later in the podcast. So the format for today is going to be a little bit different. We're going to start off asking our guests some basic introduction questions, and we're going to transition into community questions. So thank you to everyone who posted some questions in the subreddit. We're going to get to as many as we can, and we're also going to try to get to some uh, YouTube comments and whatever chat co comments that you have later in this episode. So we're going to be looking and we have multiple screens open. So we'll, we'll try to get some questions towards the end. And I want to quickly get into this episode because we have a lot to talk about, but thank you to everyone because we just passed 5,000 subscribers. So thank you to everyone for subscribing. If you haven't subscribed to the Cardano Effect, please consider subscribing. Whether you like our content or you dislike our content, tune in because we're putting high quality content out there. So with that being said, we have lots of special guests that, uh, today. And um, I want to remind everyone that last week's episode, episode 33, we had the Saturn Network um, people on the team on the Cardano Effect podcast. And we talked about everything from DEXs, so decentralized exchanges versus centralized exchanges, to possible interoperability between the Saturn token and Cardano in the future. We talked about the state of crypto. We talked about Binance. We talked about Ethereum Classic. Lots of cool things that we talked about. So please check that out. So without further ado, none of what we say on this podcast is financial advice or should be taken as such. Remember, you are your best financial advisor. And if you don't think you are, you need to find someone who's qualified to do so. So with that being said, Rick, how are you doing today? What's going on? Hi, Philippe. Hey, thanks for introducing the podcast. So we're, we're live today and we have six different people dialed in. So we're testing the limits of the technology that we have. And we're also spread across two continents. Uh, we got Sebastian and I in Japan and everybody else back on the North American continent. So let's see how that goes with a live broadcast. Now, I'd like to introduce our guests. Returning to the podcast is Mr. David Esser, the Senior Product Manager for Cardano at IOHK. We also have two new guests, Mr. Sam Leathers, Elite DevOps Engineer, and Mr. Alejandro Garcia, the Education Product Manager. I'm going to take a moment to allow each of them to introduce themselves. So uh, Alejandro, would you like to go first and uh, tell us a little bit about yourself? What's your background and where you're dialing in from? Hi. Yes, I'm, I'm Alejandro Garcia. I'm a computer science teacher, and I've been at IHK for two years, also teaching at the university. And uh, I'm dialing from Mexico, a small city called Zacatecas. Excellent. Thank you. And thanks for being on the podcast. Thanks for dialing in today. And we also have Mr. Sam Leathers, the lead DevOps engineer. And Sam, uh, where are you dialing in from today? And tell us a little bit about yourself as well. I'm from uh, State College, Pennsylvania. It's a small town in the center of Pennsylvania. Uh, I'm the lead DevOps engineer for IOHK. I've been with the company now for about a year and a half and been leading the DevOps team for about four months. And that's pretty much about me. All right. Thank you, Sam. I appreciate it. And thank you for being on the podcast. And today we're going to start off with Mr. David Esser. And David's going to uh, lead us off with the, the main point of this live broadcast is the Shelly testnet has been released. So uh, David, testnet program launched. Tell us about yeah. it. Yeah, so so we started it. Um, uh, we're excited. This actually, guys, you know what this means? It's the beginning of Shelly. We've been talking about Shelly forever, so we now have the definitive answer for when Shelly. Although, although obviously, it's not done. So we're gonna. This program is starting with an MVP, minimum viable product. This is core capabilities. And so this is the beginning of Shelly, not the end. We're still going to deliver the full capabilities we talked about, but we're going to start by working with the community and testing core capabilities. And so then as we test things, as we refine documentation, the way the, 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 the training we've created, then we roll out more stuff. And so we're calling this first part a self node, which, uh, which we made up to describe it. And what that means is blockchain on a box. 
It actually is a full blockchain, which would run right only on your computer and allow you to test these core capabilities. What's not there yet is networking between different servers and an incentives model, which will be which will be coming soon. And so we're going to test those capabilities. We're going to test delegation, staking, and stake pools, and 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 find issues, and uh, and uh, and and improve it and add those capabilities. And so, talking about how this will roll out. So the next thing we would add is networking, and 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 the networking would allow you to run nodes on separate servers and have those servers be talking to all the other servers. And so so that that will be the next phase of the uh, of the testnet program. And then we'll follow that with the incentives model, where we'll be not just doing delegation and staking, but testing the incentives reward model to see how it's supporting the human interactions. Humans, humans are unpredictable, predict, predictable. And so we have this model designed with parameters built in, and now we have to see how it behaves in the real world and, and adjust the parameters to match what humans do. And so that's going to be really, really, uh, really interesting. We'll also be finding a bunch of bugs, right? So there, are, maybe, probably, and so we will we will be releasing uh, fixes uh, as needed for those. So we can't plan those in advance, uh, but but uh, but they'll likely be coming. And 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 this isn't just about looking at the code, though. Um, the, there's a really important other reason we're doing that, and that is we're trying to get feedback on the instructions and the documentation. Of, across a whole bunch of, of, of axes, right? You've got three main OS platforms, Linus, OXX, OSX, and Windows. Um, uh, then you've got the major cloud platforms. We have participants in all of them. And then we have people that might be you know, relatively non-technical hobbyists into, into highly technical hobbyists, all the way up to pros who are planning to operate a stake pool eventually as a business. And we need to be building documentation installs all of the support that we need to support all of those people across all of those platforms and all of those hardware uh, uh, infrastructures. And so, so what better way could we, could we build to, uh, to refine all that stuff than to work directly with the, with the community? And so we've been hearing for a while that lots of people were interested. And so we put a questionnaire out. And we said, hey, guys, can you please tell us something about yourself? We wanted to learn about these folks. And so what are they interested in? Why, why are they wanting to host a stake pool? Is it a hobby or is it a business? What's their technical background? Um, uh, why are they seeking to do it? Where, where are they? Where are they located? Um, uh, what, what, uh, 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 what hardware might they be wanting or planning to run on cloud platforms? All of those things. And we learned a tremendous amount from them. So, and these are really amazing people. And, uh, and so we're working really closely with those folks. We're uh, uh, getting their feedback. They're helping us improve the documentation. They're, in, they're interacting directly with us. Feedback's already been, been really positive uh, and interactive. Um, I want to, one quick side note, I just wanted to make sure and bring it up because I saw a comment in, in some of the chat groups that, hey, a couple of us didn't get an invite and you know how did you choose? And the answer is we didn't choose. We, we, we carefully messaged every single person who signed up. So if you didn't get one, I'm troubled by that. There's a couple of possibilities. It could be some spam filter somewhere. It might not even be on your computer. Most, most email services even have spam filters that you might not even interact with. Or it could be also that we just screwed up and, and didn't email you. Either way, we would love to know about it. And so let us know, and we'll make sure that, that you're, uh, you're in that group that we're communicating directly. But also, we're not just working with those. This is public. The, 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 the GitHubs are open to all. Anyone can play with this stuff. It's just that these people have stepped up to collaborate closely with us and give us feedback and help us refine this and fix it. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and so anyway, if you want to be part of that group, by all means, um, let us know. It, it, it's worthwhile emphasizing, though, that this is the early stage. And so um, a few things might be rough, might be difficult initially. We, we might have bugs. We might have documentation errors. We might not have explained something clearly enough. We tried really, really hard, but you know we're, we're not perfect. And so this early group, you're blazing the trail for the folks who will follow. And if you want to participate in that and you have the skills and knowledge to help, wonderful, come on board. But if you feel like you don't want to go through that, it might be a little bit of trials and tribulation. Then, then just wait a little bit until we are able to smooth things out, and that and that pales that trails a little bit uh, more well trod, and 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 then you can come along. So, 
Uh, there's a Cardano testnet website to support all this. It's got a lot of information and training there. Uh, it's there's GitHub repo where there's the code and the instructions also, and you can that's where you can interact with us and, and submit feedback. And uh, 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 the overall theme is so this is a decentralized system, right? So so why wouldn't we use a decentralized process to test and refine it? And so that's what we're going to do. And if this is a system which will eventually be owned by the community, then why wouldn't we collaborate with the community to test and refine it? So, so that's that's what we think is the best approach, and and that's what we've released, and we're starting down that path. That sounds great. All right. Thank you, David. Yeah. And I so one of the questions. Oh, sorry, Philippe. No, I, I was going to go through the timeline. Question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you go, brother. You go. Okay. <laughs> no, I was going to ask a quick question that I was interested yeah. in because you received 150 responses for the questionnaire. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's quite a lot since we're, we still have some time before mainnet hits. So yeah. I'm anticipating there are going to be a lot more interested stake pools over yeah. the coming months. And Charles has said um, multiple times in multiple AMAs that he wants a target of around 1,000 stake pools. Yeah. But it seems like the trajectory may take you over that a thousand. Is there some kind of cap that you're looking for, or are you just going to let this um, run free and there's, see there's, how many? There's no, there's no cap. Everyone's open to participate, um, and I'll talk about about that thousand in a sec. But anyone can do it, and it and uh, the, the 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 thousand number comes from a specific place, and that is that the that the incentives model is is optimized so that uh, uh, when a stake pool, we want a stake pool to pretty quickly get good a good number of people delegating to it uh, if it's meeting all of its requirements and performing appropriately and all of those things, doing what it should. We, you would want it to get pretty quickly up, up to the level where it where it's works, right? Where, where, where it's, it's self-supporting. There's enough delegates that, uh, de delegations to it that it's supporting. Um, but you also wouldn't want to end up in a scenario like you know Bitcoin right now, uh, over 50% of the hashing power ends up controlled by between four and 10 uh, mining groups, depending on you know wh wh what day of the week it is, right? It changes over the, over the course of months. And it's pretty scary. Uh, that's probably safe. We probably can trust those mining pools, but that's, uh, that's just, we, we would like to try to be more decentralized than that. And so we've optimized it so that it, when, if you get more and more people delegating to you, the profits, the rewards that, that the delegator, the person who might delegate to the stack will get, they start to go down a little bit, right? So that it goes up and up and up until you get to that right level and then it would go down and that would motivate people who are gonna delegate their stake to delegate it to a different stake pool that, that isn't in that place. And so the equilibrium should balance out, at least initially, we've set it at about 1,000 because that seems like a, a nice place to balance it out. And then we'll learn from that. And that makes us 50 to 100 times, we believe, more decentralized than, uh, than Bitcoin and, uh, and quite a bit more decentralized than, than other, uh, uh, other platforms. And so, so that's the deal. But that doesn't mean that, that's, that there could be only that many stake pools. No one would ever be stopped from signing up. No one would ever be restricted. Uh, there could be uh, uh, 10,000 out there, but um, the issue is whether or not people delegate to them and, and the models designed to, to achieve a core group of a, of a, of a thousand there. Does yeah, that make I sense? Can, I, I can yeah, add some more historical context also. Uh, so basically for any uh, computer network, the more people there are, the harder it is to sync the state of the network, right? And so when I was originally designing the incentives, it seemed like 100 was totally possible, right? And the question was, OK, should we go for 1,000 or is, is 100 good enough? And so you might remember uh, sometime last year, I believe, I was just on a, a survey to the community. It was like, are you interested in running a stake pool? What background do you have? And these kinds of questions. And uh, at that time, we got, I believe, like over 1,000 people who had uh, sufficient technical knowledge to, to reasonably run a stake pool. And so with that, I just said, okay, well, we know we can do a hundred and we know we have more than a hundred people interested. So probably we should kind of take it up a notch and do the extra work required to build a network that is scalable enough to hit a thousand, uh, nodes. So that's kind of the historical background for how that number came about. Uh, so obviously not, there's no hard cap at a thousand. 
uh, but the incentives kind of stop there uh, to help the network sync at, at a reasonable rate. That's a great point, and and I can I can continue that story a bit. This, maybe this is more detailed than everybody wants, but I'll offer it. We we had that list of people who who replied to the email. Why aren't we emailing? It's actually like fifteen hundred people. Um, it was collected a little while back. GDPR laws restrict us from emailing them because the time has passed and they haven't reconfirmed their interest because we didn't, you know, they haven't even re asked. So I can't email those people without breaking the law. So, um, so I fully expect there's going to be a lot of folks interested. The questionnaire is still on the Telegram channel. By all means, uh, if, if people are interested, they can go fill that out and then we would know. But you, it's not that you can only participate if you're on the, uh, on, uh, uh, fill out the questionnaire, the githubs are open, as is the stake pool uh, 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 testnet website. So, so yeah, by all means, welcome, join us. All right, thank you, David. Hey, I had a follow-up question to earlier also, and that was uh, you described the sequence of events as things are coming out. So I got to ask a question on behalf of a lot of the viewers. People always want to know when. So uh, what is the difficulty with answering that question as in, when will the network capability, because right now it's self-node, and then the next phase is you're going to add the network capability or something mm -hmm. like that. So mm -hmm. could you uh, briefly describe what's the difficulty with putting a timeline on it? And in summary, what is the sequence of events? Sure, sure. Well, there's just the challenge is that we're, we're, we're building new stuff. We have two code bases that we're building it in. We're building this thing twice. We've mentioned before we would like interoperable nodes because this is a formal specifications-based project. It ought to be possible to build it in any code base, and they should work interoperably. And we are doing that. Um, uh, so, so two code bases. And as you're implementing things, you know you have you have X amount of time planned for a certain piece. It's brand new. It's never been implemented in the world before. And sometimes you dive in there and you run into things you didn't encounter. And this is just reality. I'm not trying to make excuses. This is people ask why. This is why. This is what happens to us. And then other things happen. So you're plowing forward. You think you're releasing in a week. And you you find that you know the QA team finds a really hard bug, really difficult. Man, it's just hard to it's hard to it's hard to find, it's hard to test, it's hard to validate, and it's hard to fix. And so sometimes you know you can lose weeks in that scenario. And so so it's coming soon. I don't want to put timeframes around it. We wouldn't have released this if we didn't think there'd be a, a good velocity in collaborating with the team uh, and the people who are working with us. But uh, but I don't want to put a whole bunch of dates on uh, around things and have everyone get all wrapped around dates. That's not what matters here. Um, uh, uh, furthermore, we've released the self node. What if people find really big bugs there? Well, then we need some time to fix it even before we should add the network. It's not like we haven't tested it. We've tested it very extensively, but but that's the way you know that's the way software is. And so uh, uh, we'll roll it forward as fast as we can. All right, thank you for that answer. And so it's just, uh, in, as far as roll the software out, the basic sequence there is currently self node, then we add networking and then incentive rewards. Was that it? Did I catch That's right, incentives model and, and bug fixes as they're needed. Yeah. All right, thank you, David. Philippe, Sebastian? I think that's good. So. The next part of this podcast, we're going to be talking about the documentation and, tr um, and the training available for people that are wanting to run these self nodes. So there's obviously the Telegram group that you can join, um, the stake pool Telegram group. And there's a lot of people in there, over a thousand, I believe. And people are constantly dropping little tidbits. I saw that Rick was active earlier this morning. Uh, well, night for him for J Japan time. But um, there are a lot of people communicating and saying what works, what doesn't work. Rick, you got your, your note up in 34 minutes, um, so something like that you tweeted earlier today. So I wanted Alejandro to, to describe to the community what kind of documentation is available, what kind of training can people get for this self-node process? Yeah, well, we have uh, we, we, we have been putting together a lot of information for the community. Let me even test, test my look and share my screen. So we have the you have the the testnet uh, website and in the testnet website you have all all you know like previews of our technology right you guys see my screen correct yeah okay yes so here you click in Cardano and you have the Byron testnet and the Shelly testnet which is you know like general information this is for people that are you know 
uh, just as not technically inclined. So there is a lot of uh, a lot of um, uh, you know hand to hand hand um, documentation. So that's I would start here, right? If you are curious, go here, and then we also have the documentation for developers. The documentation for developers is in um, in the GitHub repository. So you go to the input output uh, German Gander website, and there you can start with the readme see the code and we have even the this uh, you know this uh, developer documentation where you have all the api all the all the commands that you can run in the in, in this self node and and in the future you know networking and and incentives all of that is here but this is more like really developer oriented right this is uh, this is hardcore and then like in the middle ground we have the the support uh, the support uh, website the support uh, GitHub repo. This is the Shelly testnet. This repo is going to be support for all the stages, right? So you you will get support in the same place, which is Shelly testnet. And here uh, is where I personally and a team uh, from education with Niv and others, we go to this uh, to this repo and look at the issues here. So we already have some issues raised by HM99, for example, and. Uh, in this uh, in this repo, you also got um, links to a video tutorial se series that we made. So with this video tutorial, you should be able to you know just follow along, and you know have your 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 self notes uh, delegating in in very few minutes. And if you don't like videos, you can actually look at the tutorials, uh, which is the same content as the video, but you know in a nice text form. You can see what you should write, what you expect to see in the screen how it should look so yeah so we have basically three main sources of information the testnet website the 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 repo for repo for support and the hardcore uh, uh, developer documentation those are the sources all right thank you alejandro and you know i gotta i have to congratulate you because I am not a developer, and last night um, I followed the instructions, and it worked. Ah, oh, awesome! <laughs> Can that's what worked. That. It worked as yeah, well as I could hear. Yeah, glad glad to hear it. And uh, when when we will add a new tutorial on uh, deploying on Nix shell, and with Nix shell is so beautiful. If you got it in thirty four minutes with Nix, you are going to do it in three minutes, and it's going to work. It's it's amazing how, how good Nix is. I, I'm surprised myself. I just started learning the, this this past week, so <laughs> I'm a converted, as Samuel say. I've never used Nix. I'm gonna have. I guess I'll have to give it a try. I gotta try something new. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Alejandro. That was fantastic. Great documentation mm -hmm. and a lot of educational stuff there. Uh, let's see. So, what do we have next on our agenda here from Alejandro? You covered the code, the GitHub, the Shelly Testnet website. Uh, we'll make sure we put those links down below in this video after we're done with this live recording. Um, there was a question there about how to get support and the feedback process. So I think you pretty much covered everything. And the next question goes on to Sam. Uh, are we good on that, Philippe? Yes, we are. Yes, we are. Okay. So the next section here is uh, uh, for Sam. And what we ask is, are there any technical skills required? or other technical issues to consider? And this is with setting up the uh, test net. Any other technical skills required or technical issues to consider? What do you think, Sam? So we're prim primarily talking about skills needed at this stage. Um, <clears throat> in some ways, the skills will be more um, demanding. And in other ways, they'll, they'll be simpler at this stage. So some basic things you absolutely need to be able to do at this stage is use command line utilities. Um, uh, you either need to build the software using the Rust uh, build chain, um, Nix, or using a package manager. Um, you have to have some general familiarity with the YAML syntax because all the config files are in YAML. Um, uh, ideally, uh, having Nix installed and a basic understanding of it is going to help you get miles ahead of everyone else. But it's it's not. It's not required. We're we're providing non Nix alternatives as well for people that don't use Nix, and especially for people that use Windows, because not everyone uses a system that Nix is supported on yet. Um, and uh, using Nix will abstract away a number of the configuration pieces for you. 
Um, so less skills are definitely required if you're using the Nix uh, scripts that we provide um, to get it set up. Okay, can I ask you a noob question? Uh, my noob question is, because I've never used Nix and I have a Mac, Mac OS X, do I put Nix on top of it or in a terminal or in VirtualBox um, or is it a separate boot? How does, what is Nix? So have you installed Homebrew on a Mac? I have, I have Homebrew, yes. Okay, so you know the little curl command that you pipe to SH to install Homebrew initially? I don't remember them. I just have to Google search it's everything. It's the thing you copy pasted basically. So Nix basically has an installer just like that. And it's a full package manager. It supports um, tons of packages, like thousands, tens of thousands of packages. Um, but once you have Nix, you can clone the Jormungandr Nix repo. And uh, in there, we have scripts that will like auto bootstrap everything for you and let you tweak the um, number of faucets you have running and you can even specify that I'm going to create the, which faucet is basically a wallet at this point, just a preloaded wallet with some funds on it. Um, and then you can also take those faucets um, and say, I, I have 10 faucets running, but I only want to run three uh, of them as stake pools and the rest of the stake is undelegated. And you can do that. And then you can delegate some stake from one of the other faucets or transfer funds from a faucet to your own wallet and uh, delegate stake. Um, now, uh, like was mentioned earlier by David, um, the delegation aspect is just for who gets to make a block. There are no incentives. Don't expect to see any rewards come after you start creating blocks. Um, there, there are no rewards at this point. That is coming, but it's not here yet. All right, excellent. Thank you. Appreciate it. What that else sounds we have good. There? So I think that right now we can jump to the Reddit questions and then we can wrap back, wrap it all back up at the end um but hey, i would, wanted to would it, would it make sense um uh, uh, sam if you wouldn't mind uh, can you uh, give us a little more information give everyone what what's supported what are we uh what are we supporting on 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 os's for all the installs and and all that stuff yeah so um but there's definitely uh that's a good question to ask and essentially the three platforms are supporting are linux os x and windows um, it can run on hardware. Um, it can also be deployed to a cloud. Um, we have deployment scripts that will also already deploy it to a cloud, although deploying a bunch of nodes to a cloud that don't talk to each other aren't that interesting. So that'll be much more useful when we have the network nodes. Um, on the Linux side, so we talked about the Nick scripts. We have that supported. We're also going to be providing uh, snappy packages um, because it's not a functional programming language in Bash. Uh, you have a little, it's a little harder to do some of the things. So you don't have quite as much configurability of it as you do with the Nix, but we are going to provide a bootstrap script that's generated from the Nix code um, for people that don't have Nix and want to run it using a snappy package. On the OS X side, we are going to provide um, a homebrew tap. Um, if you're familiar with homebrew, you can basically just uh, tap our, um, I think I called it uh, input output HK slash Cardano tap and be able to install it. I have not updated that for the most recent release yet, but uh, I've been playing with that a good bit. And on Windows, uh, we're gonna have chocolatey support, which is the command line package manager for Windows. Um, again, we don't have any scripts to help you set that up right now. And we haven't published the chocolatey package because of that yet, but we've been testing it internally and it looks like it's gonna work out really well for being able to ship this stuff uh, on Windows. Uh, hardware wise, I mean, as we saw at the, um, um, the summit uh, back in April, uh, Yorman Gander can run on a Rock Pi device. So you don't need a whole ton of hardware. If you wanna run this on tiny devices, by all means, go for it, have some fun. Um, you don't need to have like a 10 core, 64 gigabytes of RAM to be able to run this. Um, and uh, yeah, those are the primary platforms that we're supporting. We might add other ones later. We might add some other uh, easier to manipulate tools. Like there's some uh, stake pool CLI tooling um, that would give you uh, command line arguments to be able to do some of the uh, things uh, like, um, for example, well, there, there is already the JCLI tool for doing the um, 
creating the keys and stuff, but we are going to try creating some end curses based UI stuff that basically walks you through all the steps you have to do to set up a stake pool uh, from scratch. And we'll support that on all three platforms. Sam, that's fantastic. And uh, there's just one more follow up question to that before we go on to the Reddit questions. And that is uh, if someone out there is interested in running a Cardano stake pool, how important or valuable would it be to learn Nix, Nix packages, and Nix OS? How important is that? Okay, so I would say yes, you absolutely should use Nix because, I mean, Nix is just awesome. But uh, learning Nix and Nix Ops will put you in a much better position to manage a stake pool. Uh, for example, we have an IOHK Ops uh, repository uh, that will provide deployment scripts, um, and it covers not just getting your Jormungandr node set up, um, but it also is going to be able to spin up a number of services for you that'll help support that. So like Greylog for central logging, uh, Prometheus and Grafana for setting up monitoring, some pager duty integration and other options too. Basically anything Prometheus alert manager integrates with, you could use for um, uh, uh, alerting your on-call team, even something like Twilio and uh, OAuth 2 uh, support. So you can have these things running in the cloud open and basically you can only get in using your uh, Google OAuth credentials or you could set up like uh, GitHub OAuth credentials and whatnot so you can easily secure it and access these monitoring pieces from your mobile phone. If, and so when you get an alert, something's down, you can go right there, see the graphs and see what's going on. Um, I, 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 and, joke a little bit, I joke a little bit with Sam that once we have the next tutorial, I'm going to delete all the other tutorials. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't want to encourage people to install it any other way than Nix. Nix is awesome. And, and you will get so much like, so much reliability that it's definitely good for a stake pool operator to do it that way. DevOps, sysadmin heaven. Uh, I'll add just a general theme, and that is that in these early days, so the question is like, how much technical skill do I need? And, and, and Rick, you're telling us, well, you're not a developer, and it took you how many minutes did it say? 34, 34 minutes. minutes. Yeah, 34, 34 minutes. minutes. So, so it can be done. You can do it. And and there's a good reason to have some skills in these early days. And that's just that things might be broken. I'm really glad it wasn't for you, Rick. But anyway, there might be things that are broken. And so it's useful to have skills when that happens. And uh, uh, But a lot of the things Sam's discussing, like, well, you don't need to set up a monitoring infrastructure to participate in this in this test nest program where you're helping us test things and fixing fixing uh, documentation. But if you were gonna professionally run a stake pool as a business in the future where, where you really need that, that server needs 24 seven uptime and well then of course you'd want a monitoring infrastructure, you'd want all those things. If it's just a hobby and you're just diddling around with it, well then no problem, like you don't have to care very much. But if you're doing it seriously, then you'd want those skills. So. So, so, you know, wherever people are comfortable with, anyone can participate. If you're going to do this for real and run a, like a real stake pool group that's going to try to be one of those thousand, you, you, you probably would need to, you know, take those kind of monitoring and 24-7 and uptime and, and real network bandwidth and all that kind of stuff, real, and real sysops skills, like Sam is describing. You'd want to take that seriously. But, but we're not going to exclude anyone. Everyone's invited. Just that's kind of what we're suggesting. If people are saying, hey, what kind of skills should we have? Well, that's, that's what we're answering. Yeah, thank you for that, David. And <clears throat> I would like to speak kind of like from, from the stake pool operator perspective, because I want to be an operator. And so I'm trying to learn this just like anybody else in Telegram. There's a lot of people in there working on it. And so there's various degrees a stake pool operator can um, get involved. They can either simply run a node and then let it get posted inside Daedalus or Yoroi, and then people subscribe to it, and that's it. You don't have to build a website. Uh, you don't have to build a Telegram channel. You don't have to build a Reddit. Or you can. You can do various degrees. You can set up social media on Twitter, Reddit, Telegram, web page, and set up all these different things. They all take time to manage. Uh, they'll require more of your time or not. So you have a plethora of options uh, to do, various degrees. And I just want to throw that in as, a, as an input for the stake pool operators as to the level of effort you want to put into running your stake pool. All right, so we have, okay. All right, so uh, yeah, we ready for the uh, Reddit questions? Sounds good, sounds good. So let's let's start it off. So the first Reddit question comes from user Trade Feeds. So thank you, Trade Feeds, and Trade Feeds asks, 
Uh, will there ever be a one-click software install so I can run a staking pool without much technical knowledge? Sam's definitely our most knowledgeable answer to that one. Go ahead, Sam. Yeah, so we're going to make it easy for you to get binary packages using standard packer managers across all, OS, all OSs. Um, we don't have a GUI installer or anything like that. So you need to be able to open a PowerShell or command line prompt to uh, be able to do this. Uh, maybe in the future we might, but uh, I, I would be uh, rather hesitant to uh, suggest someone run a uh, stake pool with no technical knowledge because of the things David said. Uh, you, uh, you, you may not realize your thing's broken um, uh, if you don't utilize any monitoring and alerting, and uh, you might not have the technical skills to actually dig into why it broke. I mean, you need to be able to analyze your own network. You need to be able to see if there's a problem with your hardware, if there's a problem with your operating system. Uh, if uh, there's a log message that jumps out and it's like, oh, well, there's actually a bug in Jormungandr. I need to file a bug report. So yes, we are going to make it as easy as possible to run with no technical knowledge. And uh, I, uh, I, I want to stress, though, you still need to have these somewhat sysadmin skills for when things go wrong. Uh, because uh, you, you just have to have that. Otherwise, your stake pool is just not going to create any blocks. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Sam. That's uh, a great answer. Great response. Um, Rick, did you want to get the next question? I think that pretty much summed up that question. Yeah, sure. I'll get the next one. And thank you, Sam. And also, thank you, Trade Feeds. Uh, frequent flyer on our Reddit question asking there. And uh, our next question comes from Scofflaw Pirate. Thank you, Scofflaw Pirate. And I think this one's more in the field for David. And the question is, uh, there are some of us in the, or he asks David, um, David, there are some of us in the Telegram stake pool best practice group that did not make a stake pool registration request. We are, however, building self nodes and plan to participate if possible in the test net and eventually production staking. Can you speak to the level of inclusion you have in mind for this group as we move through the phased releases on our way to shelling? Thank you from Scofflaw Pirate. Sure, yeah. Hey, Scofflaw, thanks and welcome. And and I would invite you and be eager for you to participate in whatever way you want to. You don't have to fill out the questionnaire. The questionnaire was sort of brutally long. Doesn't mean there was a lot of we wanted to learn about you guys. Um, uh, but you don't have to fill it out. The GitHub's open, the website's open. Uh, you're welcome to, uh, and, and we would love to get feedback from you through the, the, the GitHub's the channel to give us feedback. So we'd love to hear from you. If it's working well for you, we'd like to know that. And especially if it's not working well for you, we'd like to know that. If, you know, everyone's going to have a slightly different uh, 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 technical platform, hardware platform, and also potentially OS platform, and it also may be cloud or not cloud. And so uh, 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 if you encounter any issues, either in installing it or when you're running the functions. And we'd love to know about that, please, so that we can make those better. So, so yeah, welcome. All right, thank you, David. And as a brief follow-up to that, um, this is a new process. Is it better that the stake pool operators report too much information or not enough information? I know there is such thing as the right amount of information, but some people might be hesitant to report. Some people might over-report. I'm leaning to over-report. What do you think? Yeah, I'm with, I'm with you. Yeah, more, more, more please. What's what, One of the things that could be a torment is when someone reports an uh, issue to you, but with not enough information to find it and fix it. So now we just know there's a problem and we can't find it. And that that's uh, uh, if you want to torture me, you should do that because <laughs> that's that will I'll be wondering how the hell do I help that person and I can't. So uh, uh, yeah, more please I agree with you, Rick. One add-on to that, uh, if you don't mind, uh, we've implemented um, the Gelf protocol that inter uh, integrates with Graylog, and we're setting up a um, public Graylog server that. Stake pool uh, operators at this stage only. You do not want to do this when you're running a mainnet stake pool at all. Um, but at this stage, if you want to share your logs with us, so like if you're running into issues frequently and you want to reference uh, log messages that you had and whatnot, instead of having to copy paste or upload hundreds of logs, uh, there will be a parameter you can basically specify when you run to say, I want to send logs to IOHK and I consent to do so. 
Um, and we'll have people that are going through those bugs occasionally analyzing them, specifically looking for any uh, core dumps, back traces, errors that come up and whatnot, maybe doing some graph analytics on it to see like how frequently this is happening on how many machines and whatnot. So that is definitely an option as well um, to be able to share too much information without feeling like you're being a complete burden and creating a whole bunch of tickets. But if you find bugs, absolutely create the tickets, even if you're sending the logs to us. Awesome. Thank you, Sam, for adding to that. Thank you, David. And also thank you, Scofflaw. Philippe, go ahead and take the next one. That sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. So the next user is from Damon and the C. And this is a question for David. And the question states, the formal specs for Shelley's delegation and incentives were published in April. From your vantage point, is the engineering compliant with features outlined in the specs, or have certain features been changed or omitted? Yeah, well, first of all, Damon, I love your username. I'm a C guy too, so. Um, but yeah, it's definitely changed, but not permanently, because we've released this as a really minimal MVP, and then we're going to add to it. So that's not because we're we're not going to deliver the full uh, full specification, the full function. It's just it's just not there yet. So um, uh, uh, the the spec has been published. Um, it's out there, and and we're we're building according to that spec. All right, thank you, David. There's also an ad uh, note there that says the small changes from the paper and the spec in the code. Um, as you discover new things and go deeper into the implementation, sometimes you have to make changes and that's why uh, the code is public and that's why you get it audited. So that kind of yeah, goes along yeah. with what you're saying. Yeah, that's true. All right, Rick. So next question. Thank you, Damon in the C. All right, thank you, Philippe. And next we go to uh, Pathoplutus, user Pathoplutus from Reddit. What did you see? What do you see as the biggest challenge in ensuring a stable test net? Given that there would be around 150 plus entities or more that will never have interfaced with this software before. What is the biggest yeah. challenge in ensuring stability? I think a couple of us should answer this one, but but I'll start. And so I just uh, I, I worry about doing a good job interacting with 150 plus people. It's really important. These people are working hard to collaborate with us, and we want to do a good job with it. But that's a lot of folks, and it's going to grow. It could be a thousand before long. So uh, 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 that's that's what I that's what I'm thinking about. Sam, what do you what do you worry about from a technical perspective? So I can tell you what I'm worried about, and I can also tell you how we're safeguarding my worries. Mm -hmm. And my biggest worry is mainnet's going to fall over. We're going to have people launch stake pools, and then they're going to uh, stop updating their software, or they're going to, um, uh, for example, um, have their node die down and uh, just not retire their stake pools. And if things like that happen, our chain quality is going to dip and dip and dip. And if we go too low, we're at a high risk area. Now, the uh, response to that is basically uh, we have uh, what uh, Charles has mentioned in his videos as the D parameter. And that basically lets us phase from BFT to Shelly. Now, this blockchain in a box does not have this D parameter at this time. Uh, that's coming, we're working on it and whatnot, but we're talking about doing a phased out deployment. So we keep a lot of the blocks minting on the BFT nodes until we have a lot more assurance in the system and that things are in a good state. And then we hand the system completely over by bringing the D parameter from one down to zero over time. Um, in addition to that, uh, the incentives is pretty much our big thing that we're counting on to uh, keep uh, the system up and running. So people will notice, and we're spending lots of time in Daedalus UI decisions and whatnot of how things are going to look, and hopefully um, other uh, third-party wallets uh, will have similar type things where people are alerted rather quickly if they're on an unperforming stake pool. And if they redelegate that stake, even if that person shuts their node off without retiring the stake pool properly, uh, that stake is no longer pointed at that stake pool. So they're not getting this uh, amount of blocks based on their stake anymore. So I I just have a quick follow-up question because I'm not sure I'm understanding everything. So let's, let's uh, fast forward to mainnet and we have a thousand staking pools and some of them get, some of them get deprecated over time and they don't retire their staking pools. 
is there there's going to be an issue with maybe some people that have already delegated stake to those pools and maybe are not That's actively right. watching their investment so is, we're we're building i'm sorry for the, go ahead yeah so i i um uh, I'm, I'm just not sure how you turn those off i i'm not following that process sure no problem there would be there's an active alert process so that the the people who might have delegated stake to those stake pools which are no longer active and actually it's more it's more sensitive than that a stake pool when you delegated to it it had certain performance parameters at that moment performance measurements it had other it had other measurements other statistics about it if any of those were to change substantially even if it wasn't deprecated and turned off it just wasn't performing anymore or obviously for sure if it was turned off the delegator, the person that delegated stake to that stake pool, they get an alert right away. So that if if the stake pool they delegated to, certainly if it turned off, but even if it just quit performing very well, it started having an like hour of downtime a night, or frankly, even a few minutes of downtime a night is, is, is not okay for a stake pool, then they'd get an alert and they could choose to redelegate. Because what would happen if a stake pool isn't performing as it's supposed to, then it's going to get less often, it's going to be elected to, to make blocks because because uh, uh, the incentives model is designed to motivate stake pools to perform. And so if they're not performing, then they're not going to get to to make blocks. And if they don't get to make blocks, then they don't get rewards. And if they don't get rewards, then the delegators don't get their portion of the rewards. And so those delegators would, would want to reallocate their, you know, uh, delegate it to someone, to another stake pool that's performing. Well. So they would get prompted to do that. Okay. I understand. Uh yeah, thank you, David. But but I, I just wanted to jump in and add, we're right. Th this is the design that's coming, and and uh, that's not part of what is in the test net right now. So coming soon, we're we're building that functionality in two different uh, in two different code bases now. Okay, that sounds good. So I guess we can skip to the next question. So thank you, Path to Plutus. Great question. Uh, the next question comes from Singverse, and Singverse asks, given that the upcoming Shelley release is a major change from Ouroboros Classic to BFT to Genesis, what are your biggest concerns or things that you think could go wrong in the process? Also, what will IOHK's mitigation strategy be in the event that something unexpected happens during or after the transition? And so I would say that there's some unknowns about how things will behave as the number of stake pools is large and we're, and we're transitioning into decentralized mode. You have both the behavior of stake pools and the behavior of, of normal humans interacting with the system and, and we don't know what they'll do. And so they might do something we didn't predict, but the, the solution to that is exactly what uh, uh, Sam mentioned. We have that parameter. So if something is not right, uh, we don't even have to turn it on or off that D parameter allows us to, to go from zero to 100%. And so it might be fine, 5%, 20%, and then maybe at X percent, it, it's not quite. Well, we could we can either go all the way back to not decentralized at all, or just back it off a few percentage points, whatever we might choose to do, whatever seemed the right thing to do, and then address the problem, release a fix, and then continue on our way. So that's the, we have to be really careful about this. This is a live active, Cryptocurrency. There's people doing transactions on it all the time, uh, many, many of them, and uh, and so we we need to make sure we safeguard its operation. And so careful, uh, uh, careful is a you know sort of a watchword, right? We're 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 trying to be very careful about how we do this and have means to uh, to bounce back for any issues we find. So that's how we'll that's what we worry about and and how we would deal with it. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. So. Um, we appreciate the response. I just wanted to address the chat quickly. Thank you to everyone who joined us today. I know it's a Friday evening in the States and we appreciate you spending some time with us today. And um, we are going to get to some YouTube chat questions in a little bit. We're gonna finish off the Reddit questions and then we'll, we'll grab a couple of uh, YouTube questions. So Rick, do you wanna grab the next Reddit question? We only have a few more. Yeah, the next one is uh, from Reddit user Oracle, 333-555. Please explain the flux capacitor. 
<laughs> I think I'll take this one. <laughs> so uh, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to tell you get this, but IOHK started a Skunk Works project called Time Flux. And our whole plan for Time Flux is basically to launch Shelly the day before Bitcoin launched. <laughs> That's a complete joke, but I just thought that was hilarious. <laughs> You're going to need a DeLorean. <laughs> yeah. I, I have no idea, but it's my favorite question. And, and, you know, if you were to look under Sam's shirt and most of the developers on the project, you know, Iron Man has that light thing built into his chest. They, they, they've all got one, so that has something to do with it. But I, otherwise, I, I don't know. It's installed after, you know, after you're on your first day of work. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I Got have you. the actual uh, the actual last ready question on there. <laughs> Thanks for that, Sam. I like a good laugh. Uh, the actual last ready question comes from Wolf and Apples. All right. Thank you, Wolf and Apples. The question is, what is the plan if, pray not, something happens to David, Samuel, Charles, or any members of the development team, especially the ones higher up the chain, how would their disappearance affect the progress of Cardano? How would the team recover? Wow, that's an interesting question. So I, I don't think that, uh, to be honest, I, you know, I hope we make a difference and we contribute value, but I don't think that any of us on this call today, you know, I, uh, it would be a short hiccup. We are, uh, it's, a, it's a big team, actually. There's, there's uh, IOHK's 200 people, and I don't know what the total number. We've, we've mentioned before the number of developers on Cardano, but uh, the total number of people is, is uh, well over 150 people um, working to deliver the project. And so, um, you know, it's a, it's a big team and an extremely smart and capable team. I would certainly like, like, I hope Charles takes good care of his health. Like, I wouldn't want anything to happen to him. Um, uh, but, but if we do our job well, then, then we even, you know, I would hope and pray that we could even carry on Charles's vision if God forbid something would be happening to him. Um, uh, I, I, I think that there's so much momentum around this and so many smart people uh, working on this that we're, we're gonna deliver it. Yeah, and that's a good question to ask, but I'd also like to point out, you know, Steve Jobs passed away and I can still buy an iPhone, so I think we're gonna Absolutely. be okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, yes. So. Yeah. Uh, Rick, we actually have a couple more questions. Um, I'm looking at the PDF document. So we have a question from uh, Crypto Herbalist, and that question is, what are some good educational resources for setting up the staking pool? I guess Alejandro can take that question because he was talking about the uploaded videos earlier. And also, if I wanted to set up a staking pool where a portion of the awards go to, um, were donated towards a good cause, is that something that could be written into a smart contract? So Alejandro, I don't know if you wanted to address that first part of the question about educational resources. Yeah, uh, of course. I mean, it's just um, you can you can as, as I said, you can check the if crypto herbalist. Uh, she's a beginner. She should go to the testnet website where we have all the test tests. That's the general information. And when once she gets familiar with 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 that, then she can move to the tutorials that Rick used. The video tutorials. She could set up. You know. Uh, the challenge is to do it in 34 minutes or faster than Rick did it, right? <laughs> and with that, she will she will get a great beginner, right? She she will have enough enough. Uh, if enough she beats him, to, she to... should taunt him on all public channels. <laughs> this would like to yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes, <laughs> definitely. And as for the for the smart contract, that's a very good question. Um, I also did the uh, uh, tutorial in Udemy. I don't know if you guys watched that. So actually, yeah. when I uh, I think that's a, a great exercise, yeah, to write uh, so that you can make a stake pool that has some social mission, right? Like every a percentage of the of the rewards are going to get paid to you know donated to to Greenpeace or or whatever organization you want to do it. That's a very good exercise to do in Plutus. Once we have Byron, right? Once we have the the smart contracts built into the mainnet, which would be at that time have you know decentralization and stuff. So very good question, and yeah. and yeah, you def you can in principle you can definitely do it. I, I, that's what I would, Plutus is for. I, that's right. Plutus can can you should be able to write write a contract that any input that you can digitize, and then it and then it would output to do that. And I I have a hunch that a number a, a large portion of the stake pools will do that. Um, uh, it's a potential strategy to to game yourself past the one one thousandths of the of the uh, uh, 
of the stake pool rewards. Um, and and I think a lot of people considering running stake pools have altruistic you know uh, perspectives anyway. So so that would be pretty neat. And inside Daedalus, where a stakeholder would be delegating their stake, there's a there will be a page where you can see the stake pools and choose one, right? Because obviously that must exist if you're going to choose one. And that will be a place where you can see information about stake pools, very brief amount of information, but also be able to find a website, uh, a link to a website that they may host, and then they can explain what's their mission, why are they doing this, you know, who are they, and why should people delegate to them? And, uh, and, it, and it might just be because they're giving a portion of their, their stake pool rewards to a to a good cause that uh, that people would believe in. And yeah. David, I think yeah, I want to delegate. Go ahead. Go ahead, Sebastian. Go ahead, Sebastian. Yeah, if I can add to that also. So one thing that's different about Cardano compared to other uh, blockchains is that the rewards are handed out automatically, right? So whenever uh, the staking rewards come out, it's not like it all goes to the stake pool and then the stake pool owner has to redistribute it out to people it automatically go, gets sent to everybody, right? Uh, so that means that you can't have the rewards from staking to go directly to a smart contract because then who would pay for the smart contract execution, right? Because the protocol has to run automatically. Uh, so basically what you'd have to do is all the people who uh, delegate your pool get paid automatically the amount they expect and the stake pool owner, when he receives or he or she receives their share, they take part of their share and then uh, send that to a smart contract. And then they can share the uh, transaction ID and say, hey, look, I, I, did, I sent part of the rewards to a smart contract like I promised. That's right. Yeah, they'd have to, the, they'd have to expose a means to, to let people digitally monitor what they receive in rewards. And then the smart contract would 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 respond based on that digital input and and could execute then a transaction to reward a, a good cause okay so there's some degree of um um owner responsibility for the stake pool i mean they would have to show exactly what they were doing yeah but if you wanted to, they, the main thing is that they'd have to find a way to to they could expose a digital source that they could not fiddle with they couldn't alter inappropriately um, but they, the contract that they would that they would publish to do that that would be what it would it would have to watch something else. In other words, you wouldn't we wouldn't build it into the to the actual code that does the rewards because that might slow that code down. But a smart contract can be written to respond to any digital input, and so that's what they would be doing is writing a smart contract on Cardano to to essentially guarantee that they that they do uh, uh, give to that good cause. Okay. Yeah. I think it's pretty amazing that you automated uh, the entire process system wide as far as returning the re rewards to the stakers. Yeah. It's, it's a really important thing. I'm glad you brought it up, Sebastian. So, so in, 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 in some blockchain networks, the rewards go to the operator and then you have to rely on them and in a way trust them to, to distribute your, your part. And, and your only means of, uh, uh, response if you don't like what they're not if you feel they're not giving you your full measure of rewards is to just go to another stake pool you, you you can't do anything and in this case they get their cut and you get your cut and that's automatic and that happens right away and and, uh, and nobody can fiddle with it that sounds good i'd like to remind everyone who's watching this it, regardless of your technical nature if anyone's asking you to send ADA directly to them for, for to stake on their behalf. It's it's a scam. All you guys need to do, guys and girls, you need to download Daedalus, run Yoroi, wait for staking to come. If you're not technically savvy and you don't want to run your own staking pool, you'll still be able to delegate. Everyone will be able to participate, but you need to understand that no one is holding your ADA at any particular time in this process. So no one can steal your ADA. It's only going to get stolen if you send it to someone that says, hey, send me your ADA and I'm going to, going to take care of this for you. So yeah. there are really not a lot of fault points where you can go wrong. Anyone um, asking you to delegate and send them keys or do anything, uh, yeah. they, that's, a, that's a scam. Just just don't do it, please. Yes. Uh, we're, we're worried about, about folks getting scammed that way. Yes. Yeah. Rick, I think we have um, 
one more question um the cardano open source question from brab rob brinks um brab rob binks so i don't know if you wanted to cover that um i'm not looking at that one you can go ahead and read it but i did want to make note uh as far as the stake pool questions that we just left off on the stake pool operators uh, there are some people that are doing uh these altruistic stake pools i'm actually curious to see the competitive stake pools i would like to challenge them to see uh, which ones perform better, the bare metal servers or the cloud servers? So challenges out on the floor, bare metal servers versus cloud servers. Let's see which ones perform better. Other than that, I don't have that question pulled up, so you can go ahead and uh, read that one off, Philippe. You got it. All right. So Rob Rob Binks said, if Cardano is open source, what is preventing Ethereum from implementing this code into their own blockchain? Wouldn't this allow them to maintain their popularity as companies make dApps? Wouldn't have to migrate. So uh, this whole question of why, if it's open source, can someone else just mm -hmm. copy and paste your entire code base and then use this staking protocol? Yeah. I mean, I mean, so nothing's preventing them at all. It's public. That's the whole thing about open source. Um, they they think highly of their code base, and they're really smart people. So they would be unlikely, at least the Ethereum folks, to come and copy us. That would be. That would be a difficult day, the day they made that decision, probably. Um, uh, but that still doesn't answer the question of, well, why couldn't anyone else? And the answer is they can. And just like many people have branched Bitcoin, many people have branched Ethereum. But what happens, as we, we've seen, we have history to tell us what will happen. And history tells us is that when a lot of people are branching a chain, what that does is it communicates the value of that chain. That's the chain that they, that's the blockchain they chose to go base what they wanted to do on. It simply increases the value. So, so, so many people have branched Bitcoin, but Bitcoin is still the core. Um, uh, Bitcoin is still the, uh, uh, the respected one. And the same with Ethereum. Ethereum is open and available and anyone can branch it. And, and some people have, um, but that increases in the end the value of what Bitcoin is doing, that that shows the value of what they've provided, and and over time we've seen the increase in value of those chains, which people have a high degree of respect for, those projects that people have a high degree of respect for. So, so you know, I, it, we'd be honored uh, if people thought what we'd built was good enough to branch it and use it for something. Go right ahead. Charles has said repeatedly, we have no patents, zero. Every single research paper we've ever written is published and in the public domain, and anyone could use it to to base what something they want to build on it. All our code is on open GitHubs. It's in the public domain, and anyone is welcome to either use the whole thing or take a chunk of it they think is a good idea and, and use it. And we view this as a contribution to the world and the community. We, we are doing this. Charles wrote it years ago in Y Cardano. This capability that we're trying to build needs to exist. It needs to exist so that large enterprise class, mission critical, critical decentralized applications have a platform to run on that, that, uh, uh, that you can build real world systems on, that real world companies can, can run operations on, that real world governments and cities can run operations on. And, and right now, no criticism at all to the, to the folks that have been building so far. They would probably be the first to say, we've made enormous progress, but, but we're not yet to the point where this is a mature enough technology in the blockchain space that it can achieve all that it, that it could. And, and we want to help it get there. That's why we're doing this. Uh, if we're successful, maybe some people will branch Cardano, but it w but Cardano would be enormously valuable in that in that scenario. So so just like Ethereum and Bitcoin, it would be it would be one of the most valuable blockchains. One of our three pillars is interoperability. So if anyone borrowed what we were doing and made it able to interoperate with our code, that would be ideal for us. Yeah, and I mean, well. we put our research in the public domain for that. We want to have blockchains talk to each other. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. And it's not as easy as what people think. Oh, Sebastian. Yeah. If I can add, if you can't fork it, it's not decentralized. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Good point. All right. So Philippe, Hey guys, yeah. thanks for all those answers. And thank you. Yes. Sebastian. I see you you over to the uh, YouTube. And see yes. YouTube? Yes. I just wanted to address Tony from Shoshone just asks uh, how valuable, valuable would it be to learn Nix OS and um, Alejandro and Sam touched on this earlier. Uh, Rick ran it in 34 minutes and Alejandro estimated that Nix OS would take around like three minutes. So um, it is a valuable skill to learn. 
So, but we can hop over to the YouTube chat section. So, um, everyone who's watching, thanks for watching. Uh, drop some questions in, and we'll get a few questions in before we we log off. So, Rick, I have this pulled up on a uh, on my phone. I don't know if you have it pulled up on another screen, but I guess we can just pick and pick and choose. I'm asking now. Any questions? Uh, go ahead and drop them in chat. Um, I'm scrolling up to see if there's any in there. Uh, one person, Dunky, asks, can staking rewards be directed to a separate address from which it is staked from? Oh, that's an interesting one. I don't think we touched on that. Yeah, that is interesting. Um, yeah, so, so when you stake, you specify a reward address, a reward account. So it's a special account in your wallet. Uh, and it leverages the chimeric ledger research that IOHK did, where you can have UTXO and accounting uh, models on the same blockchain. So basically, uh, the Cardano settlement layer uses UTXO, uh, but when we were designing the, uh, well, Shelly in the incentive layer, we are thinking about the reward, how you receive the rewards, and we thought it makes more sense that your reward account is based on the accounting model. Because it's not like you, Unlike UTXO, you're not creating new UTXOs and new addresses every time. It's just one reward account that you, you intend to reuse by design because you're receiving rewards every epoch or so, right? And so uh, whenever you stake, you'd specify uh, where the rewards would go to. And then whenever you want to claim the rewards, you'd empty out your reward account. Excellent. That sounds like a yes. All right. Thank you, Sebastian. And uh, it looks like the YouTube questions are starting to light up there. S uh, we have a question from Josh Monday. So, hey, Josh, um, how long do we expect the different testnet phases to run? So this is a time question. Obviously, it's very difficult to answer. But the second part of his question is, what criteria are you looking to meet before you move on to the next phase? So this is a David question oh, for your three really phases. Interesting question, yeah. So the, 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 the testnet is going to keep on adding and growing until it's it's – it is the code we would like to release to mainnet all the way up until that point. And at that point, it will be the, 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 the full Shelly ready for mainnet release, which as many projects do, would go to testnet for a little while for people to bang on and try. And then, and then the next step is it goes to, goes to mainnet. And so uh, um, uh, we've said before, we, we believe we'll deliver the completion, the full delivery of Shelly by the end of this year. And so uh, that's the time progression we see this taking. You'll also see another co code base get added into, into this mix before too long. And so um, uh, uh, more stuff to try and, and refine and, uh, and play with. Excellent. And uh, thank you, David. And thank you, Josh Monday. Appreciate that. We also have a question from uh, Sugar Zeus. That would be Sugar Zeus from Sugar Zeus Crypto. He has a nice crypto channel over there. You should go check that on YouTube. And his question is, are there staking and delegation video tutorials? And are there operator versus delegator video tutorials? Thank you for that, Sugar Zeus. Mm, is that a question for Alejandro? Let me take that one, and then you guys add some more details. So there are... Uh, there's definitely a bunch of operator videos as we've covered. We haven't put out a ton of uh, much at all content, I think, on on uh, f for users on how they would delegate, and that's primarily because they can't delegate yet. <laughs> so, uh, well before they can, we'll have that content out there. So it's really clear for how people should do that. And 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 it's it, the reason I want to raise it is because. These aren't stake pool operators who are expecting to have system administrator skills. These are just users who, who, who bought some, some ADA, right? And so, so we need to make that process really easy for them, both in, in making sure that the interface is simple and easy in the first place, and then that the training is simple and easy and intuitive and easy to find. So we will make sure to do both those things. Any, any details to add, guys? Yeah, I can add to that. Uh, so if, if, if you're super keen and you don't want to uh, wait for Jormungan to support this, you can go check out two repositories. One is called Cardano-Wallet. It's on the IHK GitHub repository. And that's the API layer Dataless uses. You can see what API calls will be used to, for users to delegate to state pools and what kind of responses it return. You can also go to the Dataless GitHub repository uh, where you can see the UI for how a user would delegate, what they can see, what options they have. And then from our side at Emergo, 
Uh, we'll have some more news coming out about this in the future. So follow us on Seiza and Yoroi Wallet on Twitter, and we'll have more news in the future. Thanks, Sebastian. That's awesome. And just 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 to remind everyone, the stuff that's out there, you're welcome. Uh, but but it's a work in process, right? That's why it's not released yet. So so uh, just keep that in mind if you're playing with it. Sounds good. Sounds good. Uh, we have another question from the Elite Trans question. If I'm holding ADA now, would I have to do anything different if I'm just trying to hold? So I, I could probably just answer this question. If you're just holding ADA and you don't want to run your own staking pool, and you just want to delegate in the future, just hold on and download Daedalus. Um, use Yodoi. Make sure you use Yodoi with Ledger or whatever form of hardware wallet you want. And keep your funds off of, off, off of exchanges. Keep your funds off of centralized exchanges. And make sure your ADA is safe, and the time will come when you can delegate. So mm -hmm. I don't know if anyone wanted to add anything to that. No. Yes. Uh, on, the, on the topic of uh, when Shelly actually hits mainnet, uh, you will have a different addressing scheme you will have to do to delegate your funds. Uh, Delilis will walk you completely through this when it happens. Um, but if you're just hodling and you don't open Daedalus after Shelly Maynet comes around, you're not going to be gaining any rewards. So if you want to gain rewards, you have to go through this process. Okay. And I'm sure there's going there are going to be a lot of tutorials when that comes. So it's it's very simple. Um, we have a question from um, I saw a question from uh, Winnie Poss. Uh, that's Quentin. So if you watch the, if you need a, a Cardano podcast in French, they have a great French podcast. And he asks, uh, have you tried to stake or run the stake pool on the Rock Pi? Um, so I'm, that might be an internal question. Uh, yeah, I don't know yet. Uh, we have a great community member named Marcus, who's the guy who figured out that this could run on Rock Pi and, and created this awesome wireless battery powered running rock pie it, it, it was that was running a cardano uh, uh node while walking around the our, our ihk summit uh and i'm so i'm sure he'll try it and everything that we're suggesting to people that they try i i've no i have no doubt he'll try it uh and he'll probably give everyone instructions on how to do it but i i haven't seen if he's tried it yet yeah, so the, the two people behind the Rock Pi project, are, which are Marcus and Robert, uh, they're both still very active in the Cardano community. Marcus and Robert both help out with Clio and that initiative. Robert is also a DLab fellow, so he works with us at Emergo on a few different projects. Uh, so these people are, are definitely still involved in the ecosystem and uh, will continue to build out uh, this and all the other functionality they're working on. I did see on the questionnaire, there was someone who wanted to try running it on a Raspberry Pi, which is a substantially lower spec piece of hardware than a Rock Pi. Uh, I don't know if that'll work, they'll try. We're, by the way, we're definitely not suggesting that a Rock Pi or a Raspberry Pi is the suggested hardware to run. We don't know what, this is, what the right hardware, optimal hardware to run uh, 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 a stake pool is yet. Um, people will need to figure that out. Uh, uh, but people are actually going to try it on Raspberry Pi. We'll see what they take. I'm sure they'll tell us. It'll be yeah, really I'm, interesting. I'm going to place we anticipate, on that. Oh, sorry. sorry we, we, re we anticipate that network is going to be the bigger bottleneck than CPU and memory. So I, I don't anticipate we're going to have problems on the low power devices if they have a good network. You want a good, fast network with very low latency. <laughs> Excellent. And that's what I was going to say. I'm going to place my wager on the more horsepower, the better, and the faster the bandwidth, the better. Um, that's just my guess. And I bet on it. <laughs> hey, we got another okay. question in there. Uh, thank you. For that. You're going to run yours on a Cray supercomputer, Rick? What, what's that? You're going to run yours on a Cray supercomputer. Soup that uh, yeah, I actually, I actually used one of those in 1992. <laughs> It, it's like, you know, you, you can't compare cloud servers and say, my cloud server is better than yours, but you can compare hardware and say, I got more RAM, I got more CPU, whatever. You know, guys like to do that kind of stuff. <laughs> they like to compare things. <laughs> so, uh, the time of the episode. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, old crypto, speaking of that, old crypto geek had a question in there and uh, looking out into the future, 
it, this kind of goes off topic, but he asks, when will when will Cardano SL be integrated? So that's kind of a future uh, futuristic thing there. Anybody, anyone want to take a shot at it? A car, be integrated. So Cardano SL is the core node. Um, uh, uh, I'm not sure I under I understand the the question. I think he's I asking think, about the difference between Haskell and Rust implementations. Oh yeah, yeah. So yeah, over the over the rest of the year, that's a challenging question. Um, uh, uh, those those trains are both doing really well. They're moving along quite well. Um, uh, there'll be a there'll be a, a, a convergence effort around them because there's no way that two things are initially flawlessly the same. And uh, 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 you know it'll be it'll be it'll be it'll be coming this year. Perfect. Excellent. Perfect. I am reading through the questions. Sorry if I skip around and I miss your questions. Uh, this is all new for me, and I am on my phone, so I don't think I'm getting all the questions in a timely manner. You know, Phil, maybe, it, maybe I misunderstood the question. I apologize for interrupting you. He may be asking, when are we going to see a test net for Cardano SL on the Haskell side? Um, and, uh, and maybe to read So that's not the answer to that is much better than this year. That's actually pretty soon. Exactly pretty soon. <laughs> so that's what I'd like to say there. I would rather not put a date on it, but uh, but I but that's doing well. Maybe kind of like when's it going to be running inside Daedalus or as Cardano SL decentralized? Maybe that's I think I, that's might have been what it was. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that sounds yeah. good. All right. Any other questions in there? Let's see. Uh, Carlo, uh, Crypto Carlos asked, "Do you have any comments on the Haskell side?" I think that you just touched on. Mm -hmm. uh, is there going to be Haskell node? Yeah. Yeah, um, there, there, there will eventually be a Haskell uh, testnet. Um, there's a question from Kyle Bessie. At what point in the roadmap will we be able to serve an HTML page that talks to ADA, making transactions and getting responses on verification progress? You can already do that. It's called Socian.io. So it's a project that was uh, part of DLab, which is the accelerated program by Emergo. So if you go to Socian.io, it's kind of like Infra. You can sign up to a service and you can get a nice JavaScript API to basically get transaction history and all this kind of stuff. There's a few demos out there already for uh, how to use Socian. I think they're probably on the website. And actually, we're doing a hackathon in Tokyo later this month with Angel Hack, where I'll be going there to talk about how to use Socian and how to use it to build apps on Cardano. Excellent. Wow, it's already built. And is there, uh, where can I look up documentation on that, on how to do that? Yeah, is it so on it's all on Socian.io. I think S O S H E N.io. And they also have a Twitter account. So if you go on Twitter and you go to Socian underscore IO, I believe it's their Twitter handle. So, Sebastian, do, does D Lab have a, uh, also a site with the list of the projects of things that they've, uh, that they've sponsored and built? That's a good question. I don't know. I, I haven't seen one if it exists. You, you can find, like on press releases where we've listed out the projects that, that were part of the first batch. Uh, so probably you can find off those if you look up possibly like Emergo, IO, DLab, first batch, first cohort, something like that. You can probably find the list, uh, but yeah. I don't have a specific website. You mean like Sire and Tesseract and uh, all the other things that people are working yeah, on? Yeah. For yeah, so Social was one of those. Awesome. Okay. Thankfully, I just want to remind people, uh, I know we're wrapping up and we're live or we're approaching the end here. It's only, yes. uh, we're doing pretty good. Uh, we, were, we were playing on a, a half hour, about a 30 minute podcast. We're on an hour and a half. We're good, man. <laughs> hour, of course. And so uh, guys, we're going to wrap up and Philippe stopped recording. We're going to leave our web browsers open so we can get the uh, Zencaster upload for the audio podcast. Our audio podcast is available on Google Play, iTunes, iHeartRadio. Uh, it's Google Play Music, Spotify, and SoundCloud Radio Public. We have all avenues covered. There may be new avenues coming out, and we are looking at those as well. Um, that's for the podcast. Uh, there was also a note that I wanted to put out from Andy Hendricks that he passed along to me. Andy Hendricks is one of the new Cardano Foundation community managers, and uh, he has started mega threads on Reddit and on the Cardano forum for community members to ask questions of the community managers. So if you go over to either the Cardano forum, or if you go onto Reddit, you'll be able to ask questions. He's trying to collect up anything you would like to know from, about, um, from the Cardano Foundation. 
or from the Cardano community managers, he would, he would also like to put out, please note that these threads are not AMAs, although you can ask anything you want, the thread's not an AMA, and some questions he will not be able to answer. Uh, for example, he will not be able to give out project and milestone estimates, because we know how difficult those are. So thank you for that, Andy, on getting the word out about the Cardano, uh, new Cardano community team managers, and that there's a place for people to ask the questions. And Philippe, yeah. that's all I got. Are we approaching okay. uh, finish? Yeah, time? we're approaching the, the end. So let's wrap this up. Um, I want to thank all the everyone that joined the chat today. We really appreciate it. We know it's a Friday evening and you know you could be doing other things. I mean, it could be Saturday morning where you are, uh, Rick, but uh Friday evening where I am. And um, we appreciate you. There's going to be a lot more information in the future, and hopefully we can get this group of guys, we can get David Alejandro and Sam back on for another AMA in the future. And uh, we really appreciate all three of you. I wanted to give a special shout out to Christian and Kyle. Thanks for helping us behind the scenes. This is a production, and it takes a lot of hands to make sure that things are, are working correct. So thank you, Christian and Kyle. But I wanted to... Uh, leave the floor the last words to you three alejandro sam um thank you uh, david thank you can you um do you want to say anything to the viewers of the cardano effect if not we can wrap this up and uh just say good evening to everyone sure i mean just the the the, the, the main things we wanted people to know are remember we started it's a testnet program not a single release there'll be things coming it's it's minimum viable it's a core functionality it's not the end scope but the rest will come and and this is a collaborative inclusive for everybody process a decentralized process uh, uh, to release a decentralized product so so thanks for joining us we're excited about it alejandro sam you have any anything to say yeah just send us send us your questions and your your logs when you have a box we want to know about that and thank you thank you very much sam yeah, I'm really excited where things are going, and I, I think things are really starting to move along, and I'm super excited we're involving the community so early in the process. Um, I don't think uh, most projects tend to involve the community nearly early enough in uh, their decision and testing process, so I'm really excited about this approach we've decided to take for this launch. All right. Well, we appreciate the three of you and leave some comments below if you like this live session and we'll we'll get some feedback and we'll see what we can do in for future episodes. So thanks everyone for joining. And until the next episode of the Cardano Effect. Bye everyone.